And um, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. If you don't have your Bible with you, there's Bibles there in the pew. I encourage you to use a Bible to follow along and see that we're drawing truths from God's Word. Over the past year, year and a half, has anybody you run into ask you about, do you think we're living at the end times? Do you think Jesus is getting ready to come back? Do you think the end of the world is drawing near? Any of you guys experienced that? People, people are wondering about that. And some have actually went to the point of listening to various sermons about the end times and depending on who you listen to you'll get a whole different point of view or perspective possibly and I started looking at this subject and working working through this message and I'm going to try to present what I see from God's Word this morning uh, when it comes to thoughts of the Lord coming back the purpose of this message is not to make you fearful, but to make you aware, watchful, and prepared. There are two portions of Scripture that come to mind outside of the book of Revelation that we're primarily going to be drawing this message from. The first is here in Matthew chapter 24. The Mount Olivet Discourse. One of numerous discourses in the book of Matthew, but uh, the Olivet Discourse goes from Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through chapter 25, verse 46. But to set some of your minds at rest, we're not covering the whole discourse today. That is just one section we're going to be looking at. The other section will be found, if you want to just kind of prepare to go there in a little while, we're going to be looking at a number of passages, uh, would be 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, and that is the characteristics of the last days. The characteristics of the last days. We've had the privilege, uh, both in Sunday school and our services before, studying through the book of Revelation. It's a tremendous book, a tremendous study. And some of you may remember from that and from talking about future events, we believe that the coming of Christ is going to be really two separate events. Okay, The first event we talk about from 1 Thessalonians 4 being the rapture. That is when the Lord returns for His church. He comes in the air. He does not come to the earth. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, it happens in the twinkling of an eye. So it's a very quick event that people will not be able to really see, but they will experience. Those that are taken, of course, will be with the Lord. Those that are left behind will face the chaos that will follow that event. Then, if we, if we have our Bible uh, understanding properly, there will be seven years of tribulation period. And at the end of that seven years of tribulation period, the Lord Jesus will return to earth. He will return and to the Mount of Olives, and He will rule on earth a thousand years. So the first time he comes is for his church. He comes in the air, does not come to the earth. That's clearly one coming. The second, he comes to earth and he comes to rule. He comes to rule. And this will be recorded in Matthew chapter, not Matthew, Revelation uh, 19, if you want to look at that, the second coming of Christ. But today... 
we're going to talk about where we're at in history. And one thing that's not, those of you, by the way, that are uh, glued to notes and you've got to get this blank and that blank, you just do what you can today because some of the stuff I'm going to share with you is not even in the notes. You may have noticed the stuff I've said already, not in your notes. Okay? I'd rather you get the truths than the notes. Okay? But here is something you do need that's, that's not in your notes. When we start thinking about the end times, we don't need to just have a United States of America view of the end times. When we start talking about the end times, this encompasses the whole world. So understand, the United States can either be faring really well, that doesn't mean Christ's coming is any further away. And we can be going through a really hard time, and that doesn't mean it's necessarily any closer. Of course, realistically, we know every day that we live, it gets closer. Okay? So when you think of the end times, think globally. Don't think just in our little corner of the world. Okay? That's important. As we, as we begin here in Matthew chapter 24, it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. This is the temple in Jerusalem. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. This was a magnificent structure. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This was fulfilled in A.D. 70. Okay, A.D. 70, this was fulfilled uh, when Titus of Rome um, attacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And it says here, in verse 3, and as he, speaking of Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives. Now, this is the hill directly across from the temple. Okay? So if you picture in your mind, Mount of Olives over here, Jerusalem over here, temple right here. Okay? It's within eyesight. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. Between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem is the Kidron Valley. Okay? Uh, the Mount of Olives is east of Jerusalem. This spot really provides the best panoramic view of the city. At the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus spent his hours just before his betrayal. Okay? But all of this is within eyesight of the temple in Jerusalem. The problem is, right now there is no temple in Jerusalem. Okay? There is the Dome of the Rock, which is a, a Muslim shrine. If you look at a picture of Jerusalem today, you see that gold dome. Okay? That dome is setting where the Jewish temple would have been. Okay? So hopefully you kind of get an idea of where we're coming from with this. So, the disciples, let's look at verse 3 again. He, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. And they, they have two questions. Okay? When shall these things be? First question. Second question, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Two questions, two important questions. You see, the disciples thought the kingdom, they thought the kingdom would appear soon. So the destruction of the temple did not fit what they had envisioned to take place. Jesus is talking about uh, the temple being destroyed. And they're wondering, okay, how does this fit into everything? Because we're not looking for the, we're looking for you to, to reign here on earth, to overthrow Rome. You're the Messiah. And really, um, the questions may have been prompted here that we see from what Jesus said in chapter 23, verse 38. If you remember, well, let's start in verse 37 to put it in, into clear picture. Jesus said in chapter 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I, you may want to underscore that, that's important, how often I, 
How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, but ye would not. So Jesus is saying, I would have, but ye would not. And now notice verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So following that is when the disciples draw Jesus' attention to the beautiful temple. And he says what he says in verse 2 about the temple being thrown down. And again, this came to pass in AD 70. Now, they ask these two questions. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming? So as we study, I want you to look at Jesus' response to these two questions, and we're going to take his, the questions backwards. We're going to answer them backwards, okay? The second question we're going to take first. So what shall be the sign of your coming? Again, the disciples at that point in time did not expect His coming to be that far in the future. They were expecting His coming as a triumphant Messiah. So here Jesus begins answering these two questions, taking the, the second one first. Okay, the second question first, what shall be the sign of your coming? Notice, He says in verses 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, Think of your false prophets as false teachers. And shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Therefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. And Jesus basically reiterates these truths in verse, verses 11 23 through 26 of the same chapter. And as you notice, those of you that are following the outline, the first sign is deception and apostasy. Okay? So if you're doing a little check of what's going on from the time Jesus was on earth, a little bit over 2,000 years ago until now, there's been a lot of deception and apostasy. We have whole churches and whole denominations that have gone apostate. We have cults. We have churches that claim to hold to the truth, that at one time held to the truth, that is now compromising biblical truth. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons. They'll depart from the true faith and, and follow doctrines of demons, seducing spirits. He talks about the latter times. Now, let's make this clear for our study. If you look from a biblical standpoint at the latter days or the last days, that period is from the first coming of Christ until His return. You with me? So if somebody says, are we in the last days? Absolutely, we are. But those last days began when Jesus was on this earth. We're living in the last days. Okay? Now, there will be a, an escalation as time draws closer to the end. An escalation of some of the things Jesus is speaking of. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there will be a worsening of these things that we're going to be going over. Some shall depart from the faith. This departure speaks of a falling away from the original position. 
Okay? The word we use is apostasy. Falling away from the truth. It's to fall away. It's, it's an abandoning of truth. A deliberate rejection of truth once it's known. So there will be apostasy. Doctrines of demons. In other words, teachings that originate with demons. I can think of a few. Evolution. Homosexuality, transgender, bisexuality, all the LGBTQ beliefs. Those things are not from God. Sexual immorality, being accepted as a lifestyle. Cohabitation is the way of life. How about abortion? How about the denial of the deity of Christ? How about the denial of the resurrection of Christ? How about the denial of eternal punishment in hell? How about the denial of Scripture itself or the reinterpretation of the Bible? How about compromise with sin? How about toleration of sin within the church? How about no need for repentance? Or you can get to heaven by your own self-worth and good works. So you don't have to look long to find a whole list of stuff that could have very well had its origin with Satan. 2 Timothy 3, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4 says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means healthy doctrine. Okay? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Okay? In other words, they'll want to hear things that tickle the ears, the things that will make them feel good, but not necessarily all the truths of God's Word. It says they will not endure sound doctrine. People becoming really intolerant of the confrontive, demanding preaching of God's Word. They don't want that. They will be driven of their own lust. They, want, they will want pleasant sensations that leave them feeling good about themselves. People will want what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. We use the words, their ears tickled. Wanting to hear what is culturally acceptable. And if you follow the church enough, you see that there are some churches that are changing their positions based upon allowing people to feel comfortable. They will want their itch to be scratched. They will want to be entertained but not challenged from biblical truth. And Scripture says of such, turn away. If some of you are completely lost, I've been in 1 Timothy uh, 4.1 and I've been in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Now I'm going to Jude 3. Thought you might say, well, I thought you were in Matthew 24. I am. We're just expounding on what that's saying when he says that there will be deception and apostasy. This is what it looks like. Um, Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that means that was going to be his topic. He was going to write of the common salvation that we all experience. He said, It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that, he changed his topic, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You see, this deception and this apostasy was around when the apostles were writing the New Testament. And it's been around ever since. So this deception and apostasy is not necessarily anything new. It may be new in America, but globally and historically, not new. Not really even in America if you think about it. Then we'll go to the second thing. The first thing would be deception and apostasy. Notice the second thing, though, um, in verses 6 and 7. And they shall hear of wars... And rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, 
But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You see that? You ever wondered how many wars America's been in your lifetime? You probably count up a few. But he's talking about wars and anarchy. That's what he's talking about. And within this scope, there's been a lot of wars. There's been wars that America's not even been involved in. But we've had wars, right? I'm not trying to underplay any of this. I'm trying for us to see, though, that we've had apostasy and deception. We've had wars. And notice what he says in verse 7 also. And there shall be famines. Have we had famines in the world? Yeah. You know how it's not as prevalent now as it used to be, but you would used to would see the, these poor little children that that were just skin and bones and you could see their ribs sticking out in commercials where people, they were looking for people to send money for food. There's, there's areas of the world that experience famines. Now let's get to what else that verse says, and pestilences. This is one that will get our interest. Contagious or infectious diseases. Pestilence. That's why people today, are, their attention is toward, well, is this the end times drawing near because we have a pandemic upon us. Contagious or infectious disease. I went back and looked at a few things. 1346 to 1353, we had the Black Death or bubonic plague. We weren't around at that time, but it was bad. The death toll was somewhere between 75 and 200 million people in Europe and North Africa. Taking the low number, say it was just 75 million, that's 21% of the Earth's population at the time. 21%. So imagine how that would have been compared to how we're being about the COVID right now. And again, by all means, I'm not trying to downplay COVID. But let's go a little further. 1918 to 1920 was the Spanish flu, in influenza. The death toll was somewhere between 17 and 100 million worldwide. Then 1855 to 1960, the third plague pandemic that was referred to, bubonic plague again. Death toll from that somewhere between 12 and 15 million worldwide. 1981 to present, this is interesting, 1981 to present, HIV or AIDS, the death toll has been 36.3 million worldwide. Then we get to 2019 to the present COVID death toll. Somewhere between 4.6 and 10.2 million worldwide, depending on what statistics you use. This ranked eighth in the list of pandemics, taking the high number that we've had 10.2 million deaths from COVID. That equals out when you consider the Earth's population now to 0.125%. So as bad as it is, and those of you that have had it, I feel for you because you know about a year ago this time I had it as well. Got the, And you know when you get pneumonia with it, it is bad. We're not downplaying it. But my point is throughout history, there have been pandemics. There have been contagious and effect, infectious diseases. Okay? Let's go a little further. Again, we're trying to draw these things from God's Word this morning. Look at, look at what else it says after it says um, pestilences. It says, and earthquakes in diverse places. Where just had an earthquake? Haiti. Had one a number of years ago as well. Other places have earthquakes, right? In other words, natural disasters. Okay? Earthquakes in diverse places. And notice what he says after that. Chapter 24, uh, verse 8. All these 
are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. So these things so far have been going on since Jesus left here. Okay? When he says the beginning of sorrows, that word sorrows is like birth pains. A thing that will grow worse and worse. This was a beginning. These things are the beginning. They're like a birth pain. They will grow worse and worse. Then we see in verses 9 and 10. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. Okay, offended. And shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Wow. Affliction and persecution. We look at the potential of persecution in America rising, and I believe it will, and it is. According to Open Doors, though, this is a, a site that gives us statistics. In just the last year, this is something we don't hear about on the ABC Nightly News or Fox News. According to Open Doors, in just the last year, over 340 million Christians living in places or living in places where they've experienced high levels of persecution and discrimination that's 340 million 4761 Christians have been killed for their faith 4761 Christians have been killed for their faith 4488 churches and other Christian buildings have been attacked 4,277 believers have been detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Persecution in other areas of the world is rampant. So it makes what we are facing in America basically like nothing. But we can't allow America, as things do grow worse in America, and as we talked about last week, God's potential judgment on America to be the gauge that we judge global, globally what's happening. Okay? So when did the last time start? When Jesus left this earth, His ascension. The light we're living now in the last days have been. Okay? These things have been going on. Matter of fact, all of Jesus' disciples, with the exception of one, the Apostle John, died as martyrs. Many Christians in many different countries have died to give their lives so we could have the Scriptures. So in other words, it's been a lot worse. Notice verse 14. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 12. And because of iniquity, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I see apathy there. The love of many waxing cold. What did Jesus say to his church? How, what did he say how we would be recognized as true believers? By our love for one another. He said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay? And here he's saying is, is in the end times the love of many will wax cold. So we have apathy. Then verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We see the perseverance of the saints. The saints will continue. The church will not be wiped out. Verse 14, the accomplishment of the gospel being preached to all nations. It says in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And that is becoming more and more doable as time goes on. Probably more durable than it has ever been. But notice just the first 14 verses, because beginning in the 15th verse, and look at that with me, Matthew 24, verse 15, It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So when we get to verse 15, 
I've taught and do believe that this is the beginning, verse 15, of the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. Okay? Let that sink in for a second. So if, if our, if our theology is right about end times, our eschatology theology is the rapture is going to take place prior to verse 15. That means if you're saved today, if you're born again, you're out of here. What the Lord records in 1 Thessalonians 4 has taken place. In the twinkling of an eye, as 1 Corinthians 15 says. So we begin in verse 15, the final three and a half years of the tribulation, which is referred to as the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. Now notice here, uh, number 10 in your outline, desecration. He says, When therefore you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now here, we have to understand what he's talking about here. This will involve the holy place being the Jewish temple. Okay? The Jewish temple will be in Jerusalem. Not the United States. But Jerusalem. Okay? First of all, letter A in your outline, the temple in Jerusalem. There is no temple now in Jerusalem. No temple. The Dome of the Rock, which is controlled by the Muslims, is sitting on the Temple Mount. So something's got to take place there. So if you happen to be lost in here today, and, and if the rapture does occur and you're still here, what you're going to watch for is the temple going up. I don't know how they're going to do it. But that part of Jerusalem is under uh, Muslim control. Okay? That temple mount is under Muslim control. So, you've got to have a temple. Then you're going to also have the rise of the Antichrist, the popularity of a certain man. This guy will be it. Okay? We think we've had some world leaders that are powerful and uh, popular and, and, and everything. Man, wait till this guy comes on the scene. Okay? Revelation 13 verses 1 through 3 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, figuratively, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was like the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, the dragon being Satan. The beast is the Antichrist, the dragon Satan. That's where the Antichrist's power will come from, from Satan. And his seat and great authority. And I... In verse, um, we skip over to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and through 5 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, be revealed, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. So that, listen to this, he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I believe, folks, that is the desolation, we're, or, or, or the desecration we're talking about. This guy will be so bold at this point in the tribulation that he will set himself up in the temple of God saying he is God. God. showing himself that he is God and it says remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things I said this last week you know certain presidents we look back on and say man what were the qualities of them I said Bill Clinton was smoothness slick they called him slick Willie. that man whether you agreed with his politics or not could almost convince you to, con to agree with him because he was so smooth and so well spoken George W. Bush, I just gave him likability. He helped us through 9-11 as a good leader. Likability. Obama. Popularity. As I said, you could purchase posters of the president. Never seen that before in my life. Then Donald Trump. Insight and strength. I thought his administration communicated that. Joe Biden. Dishonesty and deceit, I'm sorry to say. 
Okay, but you take all of these qualities that I've just brought out about these guys, the former presidents of the United States, and you might want to throw a Putin in there and some of these other leaders, and you have the Antichrist. Why? Because he's all of that, and probably much, much more. He will rise to power, we're told in Scripture, in the last days. Satan does not know everything. He's not omniscient like God. So at any point in time in history, Satan has had to have a man ready to step into that role as Antichrist. The Antichrist will rule the world, not just America, the world. He will rule by international consent. All of these countries are going to come together around them. He will control the global economy. He will actually bring prosperity. He will rule by deception. He will be an intellectual genius. He will be a great order. He will be a military genius. Not like some of the military folks, sadly to say, we've got now. He will establish a peace treaty with Israel for three and a half years prior to this desecration of the temple because he'll break it. That's what the desolation of the temple is. He will claim to be God. His power will come from Satan. So we have a temple in Jerusalem under desecration. We have the rise of the Antichrist. We have um, the development of technology. This plays into it. Remember the Six Million Dollar Man? I used to love that show, Lee Majors. It started out, we have the technology. We can rebuild him. Remember that? Well, folks, we have the technology now for what Scripture tells us. You have the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast is spoken of in Revelation 13, 16 through 18. If it sounds like I'm hurrying, I am. Got a lot to cover. The mark will be applied to people either their right hand or their forehead. Okay? The mark will be required to buy and sell. The mark will be a number. The number six in the Bible is the number of man. We've heard Mark of the Beast being 666. Okay? Some wonder or even go as far as thinking, well, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? Don't think so. Don't think so. You know what? If our eschatology and theology is right, we won't be here for that mark. But the technology is here. How many of you have got a dog that has a chip implanted? Where if he's gone to lost or something, you, they can tell you that you're the owner. Any of you got a dog with chips? Don't think that can't be implanted in people. Don't think the barcode concept that you have when you go scan your stuff out at Walmart can't be placed in your head or your hand. The technology is there. I'm not saying barcodes or the little thing that's implanted in your dog is, is a mark of the beast. What I'm saying, and this is the title of the message, kind of says it well, is a foreshadowing of biblical prophecy. These are things that are close to what the scriptures are saying, but we're not saying that. And here's where I think we have to be very careful. If I stood up today and said, well, this is this, and this is this, and this is this, and if we find out down the road it's not, I've lost credibility. Okay? So I'm not going to say Jesus is coming tomorrow, or Jesus is coming in your lifetime and my lifetime. He very well may. It is getting closer with every day we live. We know that. But we have to go by what Scripture says and look at what Scripture says on a global scale. You know, something else that Scripture tells us, it's very interesting. We have instant media coverage. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, speaking of Jesus, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him, the Jewish people, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Folks, this is the second coming of Jesus. This is not the rapture. At the rapture, nobody will see Him. It will be so quick. Second coming of Jesus, when He comes to earth, it says every eye will behold Him. Instant media. 
they can have something going over right now over in Jerusalem and guess what? You can see it on TV at home. So it's very possible, I'm not saying media is going to be the way we're going to see the second, those that will be here will see the second coming of Christ, but it's very feasible. Things are in place. As I said, we have the technology. Does that mean it's ready to happen? No. Again, the disciples of Jesus thought these things would go on in their lifetime, and to a point, some of it did. Then we go to the second question the disciples ask. When shall these things be? And this is very important that you get this. When shall these things be? We go to verse 36 here of Matthew 24. Verse 36 of Matthew 24, But of the, that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We look over in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, it says, But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, listen to this, neither the Son. Jesus doesn't even know when He's coming back, but the Father. As Gene sang about today with the midnight cry, the Father will say to the Son, Go get your children. When the rapture occurs, all of this stuff kicks into motion. Okay? The second thing we're not going to have but so much time to go into, but I'm going to give you the, the second thing you look at outside of the, the Mount Olivet Discourse here in Matthew 24 is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Okay? So I'm going to go through this super, super fast. He says, know this also. Literally, keep on knowing this. This is in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. He says that in the last days perilous times shall come. Again, the time between Christ's first coming and His second coming are the last days. Perilous times shall come. Perilous can also be translated as fierce or furious times. Used only one other time in Matthew 8, 28, describing a, de de a demon... Uh, as exceedingly fierce. The world will become increasingly violent and dangerous as the end approaches. That's one thing we can definitely see. Men. Okay, for men, we could say apostate. Okay? There are 19 characteristics given. They'll be lovers of themselves. Are we there or what when it comes to that? Whenever love for self is raised, love for God is lowered. They will be lovers of self. They will be covetous. Think of the materialism that is out there. Boasters, that means they're bragging persons. It's a manifestation of self-love. They're proud that's talking about being exalted over others, the idea of being superior. Blasphemous is abusive speech that disregards or disrespects another. Get this one, disobedient to parents. Isn't that interesting that that's mentioned in there? Unthankful. That means ungrateful or having, watch this, an attitude of entitlement. To ring a bell? Unholy. No respect for anything sacred. Gross indecency. That word is actually used of a person who refused to bury a dead body or who committed incest. That's how strong of a word that is. Without natural affection. In other words, hard-hearted. Cares nothing. Cares nothing for others, those closest to him. And also perverse sexual behavior. Truce breakers, those that won't honor tre treaties or agreements. False accusers, slanderers. Incontinent, um, without strength, powerless to do what's right. Fierce, that means they're uncontrolled. 
kind of reminds you all this breaking in and stuff when they do all these raids and riots and stuff in these cities, uncontrolled. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. That means they're conceited and puffed up. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It says in verse 19, the last one, having, I'm sorry, verse 5, the last number in our outline, having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Professors of mere formal religion, Christianity without substance. The last thing I'm going to give you in closing, and I'm still skipping stuff. Third thing we said, we looked at the, what Jesus taught in the Mount Olivet Discourse. The characteristics of the, the last days in, in 2 Timothy 3. Third, watch the nation of Israel. As I said, we're on a global scale. If there's any nation you're going to watch, is Israel. Okay? The apple of God's eye is the Jewish people. The Hebrew people, the Jews, have been called God's timepiece of the ages. God's timepiece of the ages. May 14th, 1948 was a pivotal day in human history. This date marked the birth of the modern nation of Israel. Israel was reestablished as a nation. That's important when it comes to end times because Israel has got to be in the land to a point and have a temple in order for some of these other things to unfold. So they became reestablished as a nation 73 years ago. In 2006, Israel became home to the largest Jewish community in the world. The Jews were back in the land. December 6, 2017, President Donald Trump formally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And in May of 2018, the United States Embassy was moved to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is now recognized as the capital of Israel. Very important when you start studying the end times. You see, centuries before the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, Jews had been scattered into the world by the Assyrians and Babylonians. Now they have began to be regathered, but the complete fulfillment is yet to come, and it will come probably most likely during the millennial reign of Christ. Why is all of this not completely wrapped up yet? One, Israel does not occupy all the land God originally promised to them. They do not occupy all the land God originally promised to them. And the second thing, the spiritual return of Israel has not happened. They have not recognized and turned to Jesus the Messiah. So there's still more to happen here. So, preacher, what are you saying? When is, when's the end of the world? When's Jesus coming? I don't know. Angels in heaven don't know. Jesus himself doesn't know. But what's important is we're to be ready, prepared, and watching. He could come today. For the rapture of the church, everything from a biblical uh, prophecy standpoint is in place. Or he may come, not even in my lifetime. I don't know. But our faith, we have to be careful in setting dates and times and saying this is this and this is that because we have to be consistent with what God's Word is telling us. Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper.